Today's video is brought to you by Ridge Wallet, helping you toss out that ugly, fat leather wallet that has been bulking out your back pocket for years. Look guys, it's the 21st century and wallet technology, you don't think it's changed very much, and then you see the Ridge Wallet and you're like, it has changed entirely! In a much better way, because this is small, compact. How does it work? Well, on the back you've got a little section there for cash, but I mean the feature, the big thing about this wallet, because most people are paired with card these days, right, is the card section in the middle. It can hold up to 12 cards, but unless you read on Musk, I'm not sure like why you got 12 cards rocking in there. I've just got like two bank cards and my ID, I guess. But uh, maybe that's just me. It can hold 12 cards. Maybe you got a library card or something in there. I don't know. You do you. It's also got RFID blocking technology that protects you from digital pickpockets, as well as a lifetime warranty and a 45-day test period, which is backed by a full refund. Look, I like how sleek and non-bulky it is. Of course, I said you can put it in your back pockets, but I just tend to keep it in the pocket of my jacket like this, and it fits easily. It doesn't like bulk it out and make it look weird. Right now, you guys can follow the link in the description box below. Use the code SIDEPROJECTS at checkout to get 10% off the cost of a Ridge wallet. And now, today's video. The more pedantic among you are likely already screaming at your monitors based on the very title of this video. So let's first address nomenclature and popular misconceptions about science. The list of scientific theories that can't be proven true is extremely long because no scientific theory can ever be proven. Theories are tested, and either repeatable results support that theory to the point that it is generally accepted as fact, or contradictory results disprove the theory. By its very nature, science doesn't seek to prove things in the same way one might say prove a mathematical proof, because to regard a theory as proven means that there's no room for it being wrong. The theory of gravity has been accepted as fact, and with good cause. Our understanding of gravity is provably consistent both here on Earth and on a massive cosmological scale. However, our understanding of gravity is also incomplete and at some point may need a revision. To definitively refer to the theory as proven would make such revisions far more difficult should a time come when some need to be made. Now, Before a theory is a theory, it is a hypothesis. For a hypothesis to become a theory, it needs to be testable, and more importantly, there needs to be a test that could disprove it if the result are not in line with what the theory predicted. But not every hypothesis can be tested. Despite this, some of these untestable hypotheses have been elevated to the levels of scientific theory, at least in the public consciousness, due to their popularity among scientists. There are a lot of variations on the multiverse theory, but the general principle is the same. Our universe is just one of many, and many of those universes are similar to our own. The most common version of this is the many worlds theory, which posits that everything that could ever happen did. Any time there is more than one possible outcome for an event, the universe branches into separate universes, one for each possible outcome. Another possibility for the multiverse is that our universe contains multiple distinct universes within it. Space is unimaginably large, and there are places in the universe that will never be possible to observe due to their distance away from us and the universe's constantly accelerating expansion. It is possible that out there in the depths of unobservable space there is matter that formed into a galaxy with the exact same configuration as ours, which then spawned intelligent life on its own version of Earth. The idea of a multiverse is compelling from a storytelling perspective. If there are infinite universes in which everything that could ever happen did happen, the ability to travel between them would create infinite narrative possibilities. It can also be a comforting thought for people, even if things aren't great here. Somewhere there's a universe where you are the supreme, unquestioned ruler of the entire planet, or even the entire universe itself. Despite being such a common trope, the multiverse theory has almost been embedded in everyone's mind as scientific fact. We have no way to know whether any of it is true. There are a lot of different types of multiverses, with some physicists having even created a hierarchy of four layers of multiverses, each layer incorporating all of the previous ones. However, all of the different types of multiverses proposed share one very important detail with one another. There is absolutely 
no way to test them. In the theory where the multiverse is all contained within our universe, it is at a distance that will never be possible for humans to observe. Theories involving completely separate alternate universes are obviously untestable, as there is no way that we'd ever travel to them, and they would not be interacting with our universe in any detectable way. To many scientists, the idea of a multiverse is more a philosophical thought experiment than anything resembling actual science. To others, it's an obvious progression of how reality would function. Since both sides of the arguments agree that there's no way to test for other universes, let alone travel to them, it's up to you to decide whether this theory has a basis in science or whether it's just a tool of science fiction authors to create more interesting settings for their stories. There are a few constants throughout all of human history. People enjoy games, people enjoy learning about the past, and people will do basically anything, no matter how seemingly nonsensical, just to prove that it can't be done. In 1972, the game Pong was released, and it was a simulation of ping pong, and it looked pretty terrible. Its mere existence was impressive enough at the time, but it was hardly a complex or visually stunning game. Now take a look at how far games have come in only 50 years. Graphics are far more realistic. Characters and items are rendered as 3G objects rather than just a 2D collection of oversized pixels. And instead of just a single screen with a couple of moving parts, computers can render a massive 3D landscape. Sure, your average game still utilizes transitions and loading zones to avoid needing to render an entire planet all at once, but for a time span of only 50 years, the improvement is incredible. Now let's assume that technology continues to progress in such a fashion. How advanced will our technology be in another 50 years, or perhaps in another 500 years. The actual time frame is unimportant here. What matters is that, eventually, technology will reach a point where it's able to run a simulation of an entire planet, referred to as an ancestor simulation. The practical benefits or other rationale behind creating such a simulation is irrelevant, because once it is technologically possible, somebody will do it just to say they did. Humans have been operating this way for thousands of years, so there's no reason to suspect all of human nature would suddenly change. The ancestor simulation itself would be exactly like the real world. It would simulate every plant, every animal, bacteria, and indeed every rock perfectly. Each person within the simulation would have a form of digital consciousness, essentially believing that they are a human. The simulation is then left to run its course. This is what is real? As the simulated civilization plays through the course of history, they invent video games and simulations, which become increasingly more advanced. Eventually, they too reach the point where they are capable of creating an ancestor simulation. This loop can take place an infinite number of times, with simulations inside of simulations inside of simulations, with a potentially infinite number of nested simulations. The probability that we are living in base reality rather than a simulation is essentially zero. Now, there's no way to prove any of this, of course. If we are living in a simulation, then by design it would be indistinguishable from base reality. We would also have no way to interact with or prove the existence of a higher reality, be it base reality or just another simulation. So, well, there's no way to test this theory. Fortunately, it doesn't really matter. If everything is a simulation, but there's no way to tell the difference, it has no actual impact on our lives. So that's comforting. Albert Einstein is one of the most prominent scientific minds of the modern era, to the point that he was even named Time Magazine's Man of the Century. Einstein is the man behind the theories of both special and general relativity, and his work remains as important today as it was during his lifetime. He also had some issues with quantum mechanics. Einstein is often reported to have hated the idea of quantum mechanics, which is actually a bit of a misrepresentation of things. His famous quote that God does not play dice with the universe was not meant to say that quantum mechanics was all made up nonsense just that it was incomplete. He believed in a completely deterministic universe, and the probabilistic outcomes of quantum mechanics do not fit into that view. He did think that quantum mechanics was a good start, but he could not condone notions like quantum entanglement, something he referred to as spooky action at a distance. Experiments have repeatedly shown that Einstein was wrong about this, and that quantum entanglement is real, but that suddenly doesn't make everything Einstein said incorrect. Relativity is still an important part of physics, but it is complicated by the fact that 
relativity and quantum mechanics don't seem to be able to coexist, at least not with our current understanding of how things work. Relativity is great for describing the universe on a large scale, and quantum mechanics does a good job of explaining it on the smallest scales possible. However, the principles of the two theories aren't compatible with one another. There are many theories that try to reconcile relativity with quantum mechanics, the most famous of which is string theory. String theory, also referred to as a theory of everything, is far too complex to adequately explain in this video. It's so complicated that doing string theory math requires 10 dimensions rather than the normal 3 dimensions for space plus the time dimension. The simplest explanation is that string theory proposes all particles in the universe are made up of one-dimensional vibrating strings rather than individual points. The strings are indistinguishable from an ordinary particle when viewed on a larger scale. In theory, string theory should be testable, but theory and practice can vary greatly. Thus far, we've not found a way to test string theory. The theory has yet to produce any sufficiently testable predictions, and we don't know how to change that. One of the main issues is that these one-dimensional strings would be the absolutely smallest things in the universe, which would make them incredibly difficult to observe or measure. Though many scientists remain hopeful that string theory could be confirmed, the outlook isn't great. Perhaps with a Hadron Collider long enough and powerful enough, some evidence of string theory could be found, but we aren't even close. There are certain hurdles that can make a hypothesis impossible to test. In the case of string theory, the scale is too small to the point of being undetectable. With a section of multiverse theory pertaining to other universes within our same universe, the scale is too big. Should these objects exist, they're far too far away to ever be observed. As for the ultimate fate of the universe, the problem is that the scale is too long. Well, that's one problem. The other problem is that even if it happened tomorrow, we'd all be dead, so it would be well, too late to test anything. Numerous theories exist about the end of the universe, such as the Big Bounce, the Big Rip, the Big Freeze. If the universe was birthed from the Big Bang, then obviously whatever ends it has to have apparently the word big in its name as well. Which theory is the most highly regarded changes over time, but currently the most popular theory for the death of the universe is the Big Freeze, also referred to as the heat death of the universe. By its very nature, the universe favors entropy, which is to say disorder. The second law of thermodynamics states that all closed systems tend to maximize entropy. So well, what happens when that's no longer possible? It's suggested that the universe will reach a state where there is no longer any thermodynamic free energy, and as such, it will no longer be able to sustain any processes that increase entropy. In this state, the universe will have achieved thermodynamic equilibrium. What this all essentially means is that the universe wants to maximize entropy, and eventually it will. Once this occurs, the entire universe will potentially approach absolute zero. It's slightly more complicated depending on the topology of the universe and whether or not dark energy is real, but it is expected to either reach absolute zero or really close to it. In either situation, the universe will be done for. The end of the universe is existentially a terrifying proposition, but when exactly is that big freeze supposed to occur? Well, current estimates say that we are a mere 1.7 times 10 to the power of 176 years away. That's uh, 1.7 Google years times a million, and it's many, many orders of magnitude longer than the current age of the universe. Regardless of which theory for the end of the universe we want to subscribe to, they all use similarly impossible seeming lengths of time. This means there will never be any way to test which is true. That's probably for the best anyway. There are enough problems here on Earth. The last thing we need to definitively prove is how the universe will end, only to waste time and energy trying to prevent something that won't happen until long after, long, long, long after humanity has totally ceased to exist.